Praise God, we continue this morning's uh, series and let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. For through your word, all things are made, and by your word, all things are established. Let your word continue to go forth, Father, to the north, south, east, and west of all the planet Earth. And let your word bring forth its fruit. We thank you, Father, that not a single word of yours shall fall to the ground and fail to bring forth. As we come before you, Father, we honor your word. For you have set your word above your name. By your word, all things are made. By your word, all things are established. And by your word, all things are held together. All the frames of reality that we experience are held together by your word. So this day as your word goes forth, let it be like a hammer to break into pieces and to powder everything and every reality that has been set up against the word. And let only your word prevail. And let your word be like a sword. And let it go forth to cut asunder all false realities. And separate it from true reality. And cause your word to separate soul and spirit. Let your word, O oh God, be like a fire as it enters into our spirit. Let your word be like a fire in our bones. Let your word consume us, O oh God. And most of all, Father, as your word is declared and proclaimed, we recognize that the fullness of your word is Jesus Christ, our Master and Lord Himself, who is the Word made flesh. But we are the flesh of His flesh and the bone of His bone. So let that Word that made Jesus, that brought Him in the flesh, let that Word come into our lives, O God, in the same manner like He has come upon Him. And cause your word to become flesh unto us. That you may establish your word, your power in our midst. And we thank you, Father, that as your word is declared and proclaimed, you will confirm all this because it is your word. Your word that contains all the power of the universe. So come. Confirm your word with signs and wonders following. And all may know it is your word. And we thank you, Father, that you continue to pour out upon our lives the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That we may know the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us to believe. Strengthen your people. Strengthen the angels that are present in our midst. Strengthen, O oh God, your body, the body of Christ on the earth. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Sanctify and separate your bride. Take them, O oh God, into the fall of your glory. And we are sent for by you that the world may know that Jesus Christ has been sent by you Father so we glorify Jesus and we are one with him we glorify your name Father for you have kept us through your name so this day establish upon each other in life the impartations necessary for us to be the glorious church Cause us to be wise to know the times and the seasons which we live. The hour of impartation. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. For all that you do, Father, we continue to give you all the glory, the worship, and the honor. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. We are talking about impartations today and the reason we are talking about impartations as we say that everything that God has done and God is going to do is going to do by impartation. What a simple concept. We receive, we become, 
Then we do. That is Christianity at its simplest, the ABC. Of course, it's not exactly A and then B and C, but it's very simple. And this is the core of the New Testament. Whenever we start taking our own efforts and trying to be something else, think about it. If we give you a hundred years or two hundred years, do you think you still can change yourself? To a small extent maybe. For some people, maybe a larger extent. But definitely you cannot change yourself fully to be who God wants you to be. So if that is so, why are people still trying? Because we are born with Old Testament mentality. And we live in a world governed by Old Testament law. And indeed, when any society, whether they know God's word or do not know God's word, whether it be in a jungle somewhere where a tribal group of people are living or in a city somewhere where civilization is established for thousands of years, the law operates. People are judged by what they do. They are punished or rewarded by what they do. The law operates. And people try to better themselves. Society try to better themselves. And this is the default mode of all mankind. We do not have the concept in the natural world or in human world that we could be changed by impartation. When the New Testament came, and when the New Testament comes, this is now different. When Jesus came, He came to give Himself to us. We just partook of the communion. Jesus took the communion and says, This is my body. Not, not anything else, but this is my body. Implying we partake of Him. By partaking of Him, we become Him. There's no other way. By letting Him into our lives by letting him impart of himself into our lives then we become him so the core essence of the new testament is to receive to become and then to do when we move outside of that we are no more new testament even though we live in a new testament we are back to the old testament and so to understand this and to understand the way the Spirit of God works. See, God always gives His Spirit. Show me anywhere in the Bible where before God does something, He never sent His Spirit to someone first. Nay, the opposite is true. He always sent His Spirit. He always appoint or anoint. The word anoint might not be in. But when He called, He gave them something. He imparted something into their life. Whether it be Noah, Abraham, or Joseph, or Moses, or anyone else from there forward, from the kings to the prophets, to the New Testament, to the apostles, unto all of church leaders, and under all the giftings necessary in the church, it has always been the Spirit must be given. The Spirit must be given and must be received first, and then we become what the Spirit wants us to become, and under the power of the Spirit, we do all that God wants us to do. When we read about those things, sometimes we don't realize there's so many types of impartation. I've shown you in the Bible. We are only conscious of the impartations of an office. God anoints a person to be a prophet, an apostle. Or we are conscious of an impartation. Uh, there is a major event in God's timing. But we don't realize there's so many impartations. So we have gone through this series and we talk about the, the seven times when impartation comes. To be aware that this continual reception of the impartation is upon our life. And I'll outline all the points again. Uh, first point is 
God has a timing. And last uh, Sunday, on uh, in the second service, there was an impartation. It's a first heaven impartation, and I talk about it. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a dimension of impartation. What happens is impartation changes us. It transforms us. And after absorbing the transformation for some time, and then we go forward, we realize that hey, things change. We are, we are different. We start doing things differently. And there's something to what we do. There is an anointing now. And so, there are times and seasons that God has determined. And according to those times and seasons, impartation comes. And let me tell you where the major points are. For this year, it is uh, May, there is one. September, there is one. And uh, then, there's more happening next year too. But well, we'll talk this year already. <clears throat> and September is a major turning point. So you can imagine, what, what must we do? We must prepare ourselves. And uh, then in the longer, bigger scale, uh, 2016 is going to be a very important year. Because that is the year that I complete the 10-year cycle and, sh and uh, actually it becomes... Uh, uh, into the uh, different uh, time cycle where it moves according to the um, period in which uh, uh, I flow with uh, the seven churches timing which is from uh, 2014 uh, uh, right now to 2020 is a time of, uh, of glory then 2020 to 2030 is a time of power and that will be when we have the fastest church growth. And 2030 to 2040 is where the life of God is going to uh, manifest in a way that we never experienced before. And then uh, 2040 to 2050 uh, is a time when we're going to experience uh, a major area of the wisdom of God. Uh, and uh, then 2050 to 2060, the mercy of God. And as you go nearer, those are major turning point events. And those turning point events don't follow our normal calendar of January the 1st. When we say 2020, we are saying that actually it starts from the end of every, uh, uh, at the crossing point of September, September 18th now. We cross over into the next phase. And uh, so it's me measured now from September 18, I become a calendar for that. And so 2016 is a major one, 2020 is another major one, 2027 is another major one, 2029 is another major one. And, and uh, so these are events that are there because we live in the end times. And we are forewarned, we are always foretold, and always keep talking about it. So they are the major events. And that's why we teach this series to, to wake us up to realize where we are. Outside of that, there are transition impartation. That's number two. And uh, transition impartation is when, um, and in each, each uh, impartation, which we never touched on this morning, which I'm going to touch on now, each impartation brings a certain thing. Like the first impartation, according to God's timetable, uh, God's timetable impartation is telling us uh, what is happening in the spiritual world and God opening portals. When portals are open, they continue to be open. God is opening various portals. As I mentioned, that uh, from uh, 2012, there are three angels that have been placed over and above the planet Earth. So those who are spiritually sensitive will sense a difference even on the planet Earth. Uh, but most people do not realize that. Remember, when Christ was born on the earth, the whole world didn't know. But now you look, many people are, are celebrating Christmas without knowing the meaning of Christmas. And they've even twisted and turned Christmas into what it doesn't mean. Uh, and, uh, although I realize Christ is not born on Christmas, but at least it's an occasion to celebrate the birth of Christ. Uh, and uh, So think, think of the impact it has on human until it becomes part of uh, the Western culture. Uh, and uh, our Christian culture. And uh, so we realize that 
On the first Christmas, actually, nobody knows but a few folks. But yet, something changed spiritually on the whole planet. And the world doesn't know. So sometimes a major event changes on the whole planet and the world doesn't know. But over 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, by the time Jesus was 30 years old, the world starts waking up. Something is different. And by the time Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, at the age of 33, the world began to see, hey, something is happening. And then th another 10 years, 20 years into the church age in the book of Acts, the world began to say, these are men who have turned the world upside down. So slowly the world catches up. And the same way, major things are already happening. Uh, and, uh, and as they happen, you will see the side effect on the planet. And from now until 2029, there will be more and more earthquakes, more and more volcanoes, more and more movements of the earth. Things that man cannot express before. Remember I said, 2027 is the beginning of sorrows. Uh, so these are major events and they are not that far. 2027 is only 13 years away. So you have a head start in that. And 2020 is important because the seven year cycle ends. Uh, it moves into a seven, another different seven year cycle. Uh, so these are major events. And uh, the first, uh, and every time God does something, He imparts His spirit. Even when He judges, in the judgment on the, on the various churches, not all the churches got judged, but among the seven churches, those that were judged and told to repent, there's always a group that says, to him who overcome. And then he gives something. There's always an impartation in the dead year of judgment. That's why this year and next year, there's a lot of impartation that is there. And I always tell people this. Even if you keep attending church faithfully, our church got so much activity, just being in church is already, already makes you... Uh, different from other Christians, right? Uh, service uh, is longer than normal, <laughs> and uh, then then you have Thursday Bible study is really Bible study, and uh, then it's not some some like stuff, and then then uh, this Thursday we're going to do foundational series anyway, and uh, then when we pray we really pray online prayer, and uh, so even being involved. Do you know that just even getting involved into that, you will find yourself changing? Not because we change you. The presence of God in the meetings changes you. And you will never be the same. It, you can't notice the, the change sometimes overnight. But sometimes you do, when the nothing is strong. But otherwise, over time, you find yourself changing. And that is transformation. So, God always imparts something when His time has come. When His time has come. In the Old Testament, when it was time to shift from Saul to David, even when Saul died, I can understand it when Saul was king. Do you know that God already shifted working? Said, when God rejected Saul in 1 Samuel. Look at it in the book of 1 Samuel. God rejected Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And uh, having rejected him, God move on into something new. He selected David. In chapter 16, David was anointed. And now you know why Saul and his people cannot conquer the Philistine. Do you know who actually conquered the Philistine? It's by the conquest. David. Saul has lost his anointing. He only has an office because God doesn't take away the offices and the gifts. He can reduce it. He doesn't. Uh, what God gives, he doesn't. Uh, he 
uh, is irrevocable. But God can reduce. And uh, God already started using David. People knew because there's something. David is supposed to be the king. But it was not time yet. Technically, Saul was still the king. And he actually was king for 40 years. And you give it the, the time that he was faithful was just a short time. Most of his 40 years, he was no more the chosen. It was David. So you can imagine, by the time David was anointed, uh, to the time that David was actually king, people still don't realize the change. But the anointing has shifted. And in the end, when Saul chased David out, uh, at first, David began to become more, more and more mighty. Look at chapter 18. David, you see the results of the anointing. Until every time when David go in and out, because remember, he's famous now. As the one who slay Goliath. And then one day, when uh, David was returning from another slaughter, see, Saul was no more doing it. He is no more anointing. God was no more with him. He's returning from the slaughter of the Philistines in verse 6. The women came out of the cities of Israel. All the cities of Israel, look plural. Singing and dancing to make King Saul. Because Saul was still king. With tambourines. With joy. With musical instruments. And they were dancing and singing. And singing and praising. And I mean it was a national celebration. You know sometimes people are singing. You don't pay attention to the wording. Why is it singing songs? Oh, nice song, nice song, nice song. They say, hey, wait a minute, why are they singing? They say, they're singing, Saul has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands, and thousand thousand. Hey, wait a minute, they're making David ten times better than me. And he got jealous. And from that day onward, he tried to get rid of David. No matter how hard he tried, David survived because the anointing preserved him. And understand this, when God is with you, no man can be against you. No one can take away what God gave. It is God who appoints ministers. It's God who gives His anointing. God who anoints you for whatever call God has on your life. No one can steal that away. Even if they try to take it all away, God will raise something up. So he tried and tried, which is a long story. But in the end, David has to run away because Saul was trying to kill him too many times. In chapter 22, only 400 people followed him. Saul has an army of thousands. David only has 400 men. We read the Bible story and we, we all know who is on God's side. David. Saul is out of place with God. And I want you to know this here carefully. All the major ministries and mega churches in the world will be shaken. From 2027, when we enter the beginning of sorrows, and we come into the peak of the times of sorrow in 2029, every ministry and church is reduced back to square one. So you think things are going to remain the same because there are churches planning buildings in 10, 20 years time. Nobody's going to be in there. If they don't turn and get in line with God. Things are happening in the eyes of people. But yet, people will say, I will think kings all die. You know what will happen when you will think kings all die? You will never be among the mighty men of David. 
God is today raising mighty men. There is only one chance you get to be a mighty man or woman to serve alongside. Only one chance. Because after that, it's a different group. And those who have been with him in the caves, in the wilderness, pursued here and there, they became the mightiest of men. So mighty that when there was a rebellion in Absalom's time, the mighty men never wavered. There were other soldiers who wavered, not the mighty men. They had their tests, they had their training, and they were fit to do what God wants to do. And when King Saul died in chapter 2 of 2 Samuel, David was anointed king. Only one tribe out of all the twelve tribes accepted him. So the northern tribe was led by Abner the general because King Saul's son Ishbosheth was a weak man. The general was more the ruler, was a king king kingmaker rather. And so he controlled the king. He controlled all the army. And when you control the army, actually the kingdom is this. The only thing he didn't take is the crown. So Ishbosheth was like a figurehead king. Why does he do it? You think he does it for God? No. He did it because of his career. Because things exist as it is. It's only for his career. But it says that there was a war between Israel and Judah. And this is the statement that along the many years of war, unnecessary war, correct? Unnecessary war. A war that should not have been fought. Civil war. In a war, many people died. Joab lost one of his brothers, Asahel. Many people died in a war. Sad. Many, many wives lost their husband. Many mothers lost their sons. Many children became orphaned because fathers have died. Sad war. But in that war, in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel was 1, the house of Saul and the house of David was at war, but David grew stronger and stronger. And the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. We want to announce to you from February the 9th, 2014, all that is not walking in line with God, whether no matter how big you are, I don't care even if you've got a million members or a million hours, you do not hearken to the end times and purify your heart and mind. For I am the voice that cry at midnight. If you do not hearken to this voice, God will ask account of you. Midnight for the planet Earth has come. From this day forward, you will grow weaker and weaker until you are completely dust. But you come alongside with the things of God, you will grow stronger and stronger and be part of the glorious church. Be part of the five wise virgins. This call is to the church, to the ten virgins who are belonging to the church. The five foolish never made it into the wedding ceremony. They were outside. Where Jesus says in Matthew 25, where there is darkness and gnashing of teeth. And what must the five wise virgins have? More oil. What is this oil? The Holy Spirit. Because to us has been given the privilege 
to impart to you the Spirit. To reach out in the God and release more impartations. More oil for your lamb. Give me all in my lamb, says the song. Give me all in my lamb, keep me burning, burning, burning. Oh, in my lamb, I pray. Well, thank you for all your prayers. Now all you have to do is receive. Because the time of receiving has come. For the wise virgins to take more oil. For it's this oil that brings you into the glorious church. See, sometimes when God is moving, we read history and we can see right and wrong. What is happening will be history from 20 years' time. In, as we look forward to 20 years' time, looking backward, which side of history do you want to be on? Where in history do you want to be on? And most important is not history. It is in the archives of heaven. Our stories recorded. Do you think that it was easy when David was in a cave? No. But we read, wow. In the cave there's, you know, no lights, no comfort. None of the luxuries they could go into their houses. But yet, they were on the right side. You know, the most important thing is to make a story. A story that we can sing when we are in heaven for eternity. The price that we are willing to pay to be part of the right side of history. And so God was moving, God was changing in point number one and some people still didn't know. They were actually, Abner and the house of Saul was actually fighting against God's will. They fought for six years, seven years. Fought for seven years. Until in the end, Ishbosheth was murdered and when David was 33 years, because he reigned 40 years all together in chapter 5. Finally, it was God's. They all got in line. You see, it's not easy to get people in line. We will bring this message to get the whole planet who want to hear God's word in line. Those who want to hear, the voice will go forth. God will give the platform for the voice that cry at midnight. And it will go forth. And it might take time for people to get in line. It might take time for those who are scattered, there are many sheep scattered all over to get in line. It will take time for churches and ministries to line up together. It will take time to unite the church. It will take time to call all the five virgins together who are, have the oil. And it will take time to speak to the nations of the world. But we are patient. God is patient. We are set on a course with 100% commitment. Angels are working together. And the course of history is already purpose and determined. Only when all Israel came in line with God's perfect will. Look at how beautiful Israel became. They found Jerusalem, which was be, going to be the place that God predicted from the time of, from the time of Moses. God says, one day I will show you the city and place to build them. Without Jerusalem, they cannot even build a single temple, do you realize? There's no place to build the temple God predicted and prophesied to Moses in Deuteronomy. Deuteron, because they didn't want to get in line. When the whole world began to get in line, we know because God has already given a pattern for the church. I show you some of the patterns that I've spoken to them. One of the patterns is 24-hour worship, which will be established. 
And we will be able to do that because we were hundreds of thousands and millions of people in our manpower. And then another pattern is fivefold ministries need to be raised. We will raise and train them, send them forward. And so there are certain patterns that the church needs to require to get into to become the glorious church, part of what God wants to do. Plus, get back to the balance of the word and spirit. We have people who have the word but no spirit. People who have the spirit but no word. People who cannot get the word and the spirit right. On top of that, your people whose motives are impure. Many ministers serve for money. They don't serve for purely self-sacrifice and the love of Christ. You take away their money and the salary, see whether they want to preach. A lot of them will not. They rather go out and earn their own money. They're not serving God because they love Christ. They're not sharing the message because they want people to grow. They're doing so because it is a job. All this purification God will do. It is the end time. It is the year of God's judgment and shaking. Look at how beautiful Israel became. The ark came forth. Israel started prospering. See, when people get in line, every single tribe and people prosper. You know how much they prosper? They prosper until into the time of King Solomon. Gold was the only value. Silver got no more value. And we are not talking about just with the king. It was common in Israel. See, when we get in line, we ourselves are blessed. Not just the leaders whom God has appointed for us to follow. And what a blessing Israel. If Israel had moved earlier, they would have more time under David. Correct. Six, seven years were wasted. Because one person wanted to keep his own kingdom. So, in the first point, it's very important to line up with God, as you can see. It is to flow with God's timing. And these are things that God predestined. Those who God appoints are already predestined. When the disciples ask Jesus, and they know Jesus was going to do something great, at first they thought in their own theological understanding it's going to be uh, just a physical kingdom of Israel. They were fighting to be on the left hand and right hand of Jesus. And you know what Jesus answered? These are already determined by the Father. And so all these are predestined before we were born. These are things that we can only be obedient to. And find our place in God's great commission on the earth. So under point number one, we can only find our place. Point number two, transition. The reason for transition is for continuity. Because every time when a ministry passes away, another one must take its place. Because God intends for it to continue. And in this year of judgment, the next year, from now until 2027, the beginning of sorrows, Many ministers, some of them, in fact, from after September onwards, some will die even in the pulpit because it is a time of judgment. And it's a time of God shaking that things are changing and He wants to wake up the body, the ten virgins. Wake up to know the necessity of time. It is important for us to know that when this transition point comes, if you are available of the same light nature to take the anointing, the anointing can come on you. So it's important to know transition point. From now until 2027, some of the men and women of God are going to finish their work and go home. Now, not all who die are necessarily disobedient. Some are obedient to their last breath and they are taken home because it's time for them to go home. 
But some of them are shortened and they're taken home. When that happens, a vacancy exists. And the reason for this teaching is to tell us when a vacancy exists, if God searches throughout the whole planet and finds you are available, it can come upon you. Which is why we teach this series to tell people, be among the 7,000 ready. Because God told Elijah, there are 7,000 more who is about it. See, God must have kept count. Even Elijah didn't know about that. Elijah says, I'm all alone. God says, okay, I want you to do this. I want you to go and right now go and get another person and that is Elisha. And by the way, there's 7,000 more. God knows. So we are living in a time of many transitions. And if your spirit and mind and your calling is like-minded to that, it can come upon you to carry that in God. That's why we teach this series for continuity. Remember the anointing has to be given. Has to be given. Say so what happens if, if one person cannot take all of the anointing? God will divide it among those who can. Surely of the 7,000, if there's, if there's not one of them who can take all of it, he might take five of that to share that which was to be distributed. And transition times are continually happen sometimes week after week. Be that candidate. That is why we are teaching this series. And number three, completion. There are tiny little jobs God has asked us to do. Pray walk here, pray walk back, all this thing. Each time we complete, there's an impartation point. We always have brought the impartation back. And sometimes God ask me, should I be in this, should I be not? I hold, my only answer always, if it's God's will. Not all of you need to be in every day. But just make sure that you're in whatever God wants you to be. That's all. Once you're in exactly where God wants you to be. Like for example, in uh, the first trip to Madaba, uh, that was in 2012, August. 2012, August. Two were supposed to be there, not there. In uh, uh, different places, sometimes I had described, uh, I think it was in in Seoul, first trip. One was supposed to be done or not there. So, uh, then of course, in some of the trips, some of them are not supposed to be better than that. <laughs> and as a result, you know, we cannot uh, have, uh, have the weather system controlled properly. And as I always say, you know, uh, when we ask, the weather angels are always very good. Uh, well, then, and people are not supposed to be there or there. Uh, there is like a loophole. Uh, faith cannot, there is no unity. You cannot have 100% unity. Uh, every time it's proven true. Uh, in the end, God's still shifting. Uh, and so, you ask me, God completes so many things, so many things. Oh, here, there, here, there. First of all, God will not ask you to do something you're not able to. So none of you should go and sell your houses unless God tell you there is, you know, uh, uh, sell your houses and then and then uh, use all your money for all the trip. At the end of the trip, come back no house, no money, no job. <laughs> Nobody asks you to do that. And uh, so one should only do what God asks you to do. And everyone must hear the Lord, Lord and flow with God in His fullness of time. So so it got doesn't want you to do something, you, ha you will not have the ability to do it. Uh, and sometimes you have the ability, but you must understand you should not do those things. God didn't want you to do or to be part of. Just flow with where God wants you to be. But what we are saying is, uh, every little completion, and just like I said, every time we have an all-night prayer, every time we have a, uh, a, a Bible study, every time we have a church service, at the end of it, something is imparted. 
even on those hourly basis and daily basis, weekly basis, or, or even when we complete a job and come back, we bless the people. Same, same way we complete something, then we bless the people. There is always an impartation. And so what we can we do, if we are not going along, what can we do? We can fast along, we can pray along. By doing that, we are part of it. Do you know what the Philippine church did? While Paul was traveling, going all these places that they are supporting, and you know, Paul says that they were his partners together, Philippians chapter 4. Because where they can't go, is they were helping Paul to go. And so Paul prayed for the blessings that he had to come upon them. So that's important. To understand that everyone just needs to do what God wants them to do. No more, but no less. And everyone should discern in your heart. And so, completion is important because you want to receive the blessings at the end of the completion. Because this blessing is something that we must assimilate into our life. God don't do something for nothing. And with each impartation, something is given. And sometimes you, don't ex you didn't expect it in the same manner like when we completed the prayer walk in Hobart. Uh, Melbourne and Hobart, we did it together. I didn't expect to receive the glory of the four horses, four white horses, but just came. Uh, then there was a different impartation in Brisbane, and the one that is in Perth is different. Uh, this is a different angle of impartation. The Brisbane one was prosperity as we so embody. The, the one that is coming in Perth is a blessing of worship. Because in parting. So each one got a different angle of impartation that God is imparting in each place. And then the Madaba trip, which most of you have signed up, we're going to have church camp actually, uh, with the church in Sydney joining. That is major impartation. And uh, so it's good for those of you who are part of it. Those of you who cannot be a part of it, uh, I, we understand and, 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 and you're here, uh, we always bring the impartation back to you. But it's good to understand completion impartation. Because completion impartation is something we, we must absorb that is important to the foundations of what is to take place. And when it's a missing element, it will always be missing. But when we bring it into our lives, then it completes. And God is very smart. Wherever we don't receive it, he, somehow, some way, there will be contact and then he still needs to receive it in some form or other. So those are the first three points. Then we, uh, we look at uh, the seventh point, which is the daily impartation, how in each one of daily life, every day you draw something from God. Every day, man shall not live by bread alone. I call it infusion. We are infused with the life of God. And every day, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 takes place. And the reason for the last one uh, number seven is for personal growth. Because personal growth is by daily abiding in it. And that personal growth is important. Because sometimes a person can do a job but don't have personal growth. You can be called to be a prophet, called to be an apostle, called to be an evangelist, called to be a pastor. You do the job well by the gifting but you don't have personal growth. Something will crack somewhere. Something will flow forth wrongly because you, whatever you give up will come from your personal relationship with God. If your relationship with God is not close, somehow it will still come true to people. You cannot inspire people to pray if you're not a man of prayer. But if you're a man of prayer, you don't even have to talk about prayer. Just by being with you, people become prayerful. You can never give what you yourself are not. If you're not a worshipper of God, no matter how you try to get people to worship, they cannot. But once you're a worshipper of God, you might not even say one word about worship. Just by being with you, they love to worship God. That is why point number seven is important. It's personal growth. And personal growth is as important as ministry growth. 
there are a lot of mega pastors, mega ministers who have stopped growing spiritually. They are like a parrot still repeating revelation that they have received from 5, 10 years ago. Their last personal experience with the Lord are decades ago. But because there are always people who have never heard, they cannot differentiate. Because the manna is still there. But slowly, something of the fragrance of God is gone. You know the difference between fresh food and stale food? Fragrance and smell. The anointing is no more fresh. Yes, because the anointing and the work is word of God is powerful. You can live on an anointing that's 40 years old. Or the word of God that's 40 years ago. But you need fresh oil. Fragrance of God. Some of you have been in our ministries decades ago. Something about me is the same, but something about me is not the same. Talking about the messages. Not hairstyle or fat messages. <laughs> because more slightly bigger size than last time. I know. So, it is important to keep growing in God. I am still pursuing God. Point number seven is important. We need to pursue God. You know what's my goal? To be the man who was closest with God on the entire planet and in all of generations of mankind. Always been my goal. Always has been. I'm not satisfied to just be successful in the ministry. A lot of ministers, once their church grow big, 1,000, 2,000, they're happy. Why? Right? Got good income. They're happy. They just keep doing the same thing. And then they form the dynasties. Pass on, you know, all that all this thing. It's, it's a job. It's an income generating thing with a Christian label. What's the purpose for church to exist? What's the purpose for any ministry to exist? To know God. To reveal God. The pursuit of God. And remember, even if you live a thousand years, you still don't know all of God. That is why, no matter how much God revealed, we're still pressing on to know God even more. And that will never happen. In ten years' time, we will be even more different from now. Because we are growing. Point number seven never stops. We don't regurgitate old things. We might repeat some old things, but move into something. Because some of those are foundation. Look at Paul in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Tells us here, In verse 8, it says, yeah, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. That I may gain Christ. As a minister serving God for nearly... 30 years, 40 years. I've seen so many times that people attempt to take over churches. Why are people so interested to take over a ministry, a church, or an established organization? Paul says he counts everything lost. The most important thing is Christ. It's the pursuit of Christ. Remember, it is not just important to be a member of a church or a part of a church. Those are part of body ministry, which in point six we talk about association, the benefits of association. 
which is about the impartation. But the most important thing is this. No matter where you are, I know a lot of people are hearing these messages online. No matter where you are, where you go, what you do. At the end of the day, whichever church you go, whichever ministry you sit under, you must ask yourself this question. Does it help me to know Christ better? Does it bring me closer to God? If it does, good on you. Keep growing. But if it doesn't, move on even if your church or ministry doesn't know, move on. So that you can grow. And I would say this even of ourselves. If we stop growing, find somewhere else that can grow. But what we covenant ourselves to God is we will never stop growing. Like Paul, we press on. We press on into God. And Paul says in verse 9, And be found in Him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. If by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And then look at verse 12. Not that I have already attained. And Paul is an experienced minister here. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. The pursuit of God. We must pursue God. We must know God. That is why personal impartation is important. Point number seven, which is the daily impartation. Every day when I get up, my longing is, God, what do you say? What are you speaking? I want to hear your voice. I have heard the voice of God sometimes, but I hear His inner voice all the time. To hear what God is speaking to you every day is meant. You know what the Israelites have to do every day? They get up first thing, go for the manna. And they represent in the physical what we are in the spiritual. Every day when you get up, look for manna, which comes from God. Let God deposit something into your life. Even if you give you one verse, one sentence, one word, and a word that you heard before, when God tells you He loves you, again, it is as fresh as you heard it 10 years ago, 50 years ago. Because hearing those words directly from God imparts something. Imparts something. So it's important for us to every day receive an impartation. Point number seven. Never stop. Paul never stop. Why should we stop? We should press on. Until our last breath, we come. Press on to know God. And then point number four we spoke about. At the beginning of everything, don't, don't run to do something. When God reveals to you what to do, doesn't mean you can straight away do it. When God revealed to you how to do, doesn't mean you now got the what and the how you can do. You still need the anointing. Did Jesus knew what to do? Yes. Did Jesus know how to do it? Yes. But He still went through the process to get the Holy Spirit come on Him. We still need the Spirit upon us. Did the disciples know what to do after Jesus left? Yes. They're supposed to go out through all the world. They don't know how to do it. Yes, they're going to supposed to go and talk about Jesus and talk about his teachings and his word. But Jesus says, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be ended with powerful man. They still needed to wait on him until the anointing comes. So let me give you an example from Paul's life. Point four. We see here 
that uh, Paul in the book of Acts was converted in Acts chapter 9. Do you know that God straight away revealed Paul's ministry to him? Paul knew he was chosen, he was called, and he must have a sense of his apostolic ministry. But like David, that is for him fresh. Now in Acts 9, all you have is in verse 4 and 5, the words in red, 4, 5, and 6. It says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It says, Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the girls. And uh, verse 6, the Lord says, Arise and go into the city. You will be told what you must do. Those are like three sentences. Actually, it's a longer conversation. And from time to time, we know it's a longer conversation because it acts, later on it acts, chapter 22, see, he gives some more details. Acts 22. And he's recounting the same incident in Acts 9. He says, in verse 7, Saul, so, Saul, so, why are you persecuting me? Then in verse 8, I am Jesus of Nazareth. Hey, the Nazareth was not found in Acts 9. He will just say, I am Jesus. See, there are a lot of long conversations. Paul was just summarizing to Luke when he was describing those experiences. And Luke was recording. And... Uh, I'm Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. Then in verse 10, Arise and go into Damascus. But the other one in Acts 9 is going to the city. The name which city. Actually, he has a lot of specific things. The way he shares testimony shows that actually God talked a long time with him. And he just suddenly briefly mentioned some things. And then, the next time you see uh, uh, him describing the experience uh, again, is Acts chapter 26. Same experience as Acts 9. The Damascus Road. We are not talking about a, a different situation. Same situation recorded three times. Acts 9, Acts, 20, uh, Acts uh, chapter 20, 20, uh, 24, 22 just now. And then you have Acts chapter 26. And uh, Acts 26, look at how long the conversation is. Longer conversation. And remember, he was still on the Damascus Road. And in Damascus Road, here's the longer version. Acts 26, when he says in verse 15, Who are you? Right? The conversation, who are you? Look how long the conversation was. I am Jesus, he says in verse 15 to 18, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet. Hey, that's not in Acts 9. But it was. He just didn't mention it. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. He even tell him why he appeared to him. I appeared to you for this purpose. To make you a minister. There you go. He knew he was called. To make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. More revelation coming. And I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me and, and, and even though there are more sentences I can guarantee you it was longer than this there were a lot of details Paul was initiated into a new anointing this is the beginning, point number four. When God begins something, he, you will receive something. And look at what God revealed to him in Acts chapter 9 when, when Saul was waiting. Remember, the glory was so, so powerful, he was blinded, he could not see for three days and three nights. What a shock. Couldn't see for three days and three nights. And he was waiting. And while he was waiting, Jesus went to Ananias and said, in verse 11, Acts 9 verse 11, uh, 10, 11, Ananias! And Ananias says, Here I am, Lord. And God says, Arise, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. You are the man. So Ananias has to go to him. 
Ananias was afraid because this was a man who helped uh, instigate the, the persecution against the church and who was holding the clothes of those who stoned Stephen to death. Because you're talking about this man, Lord. He hasn't heard about X9 because X9 was not a public event that a newspaper reporter was there taking pictures and then showing himself falling down. The donkey probably looking at him and then uh, if there was donkey and uh, then uh, and then uh, then they report, you know, a man on the road to Damascus stuck down and uh, everybody read oh, oh, the headline. There was no internet either. Nobody knew that event. The last time the big news event was this was the guy who arrests people, put them in jail, kill some of them. So no wonder and then they say, and then I say, Lord, I have heard from many. This was how the news traveled in those days. I heard from many, not just one person. Many people told me the bad things about this man. And says, how much harm he has done to your saints. Uh, he says, he also has authority. He carried authority sealed by the Sanhedrin Council from the chief priest to bind everyone who call on Jesus' name. Sounds like he's complaining, isn't it? <clears throat> and then the Lord says, Go! For he is a chosen vessel. Hey, chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, plural, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So the one who persecutes is going to suffer now. So you see. There were a lot of details of who Saul is going to be, what Saul was going to become. And remember, these are all summaries. God might have revealed visions and details of his future. He knew what he knows how. One thing is lacking. The anointing. The anointing. You never jump ahead of God. You must receive the anointing before you do something. If you receive the anointing and you do something, anyone who opposes you opposes God. It's dangerous for them. If you don't have the anointing and you're doing something on yourself, people can oppose you and nothing happens. The anointing must be. See, we must respect the Holy Spirit. We must now begin to work closely with the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God. When the Spirit of God does something, comes upon something or someone, we must respect that. The way King David respected King Saul, even when King Saul had no more spirit, because he was once anointed by the Spirit, and he still has a position of a king on whom the Spirit came on him for. Only those who respect the anointing in others will understand how to respect the anointing in their own lives. And this is the truth. We respect in other lives what we respect in our lives. You disrespect in other lives what you disrespect in your own life. To your own self, you will always be true. And the only way we can respect the anointing of the Spirit and treasure it is when it comes on people and we respect that too. It comes upon ourselves, we treasure it. We understand what it's for. So he was called, he was chosen, he had revelations of his future, word of wisdom, all those things talk to him, but he has no anointing yet. Human ability, he has some. Because he was an educated man brought up under the best teacher, Gamaliel. He had an ability, obviously, before he came to know Christ, a man who rise to his position. You don't think he, he did it by the Spirit of God? 
He did by his ability. His ability to organize. His ability to persuade. His ability to reason. Why? To get letters. His ability to draft things up. Hey, this man has a great ability. But all our abilities are filthy rags. For the work of God must not be done by the flesh. What is of the flesh is flesh. What is of the spirit is spirit. You cannot act in the flesh, do something in the flesh and try to produce something in the spirit. For what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit can only be spirit. It must be energized, anointed, and released by the Spirit, not of the flesh. So he tried to look at Acts chapter 9. Look at his oratory ability. That man can argue. See, some of us don't know who Gamaliel is. Gamaliel is a top scholar and debater. It is like being brought up by one who has a golden duck. When Gamaliel speaks, the Sandrian Council pays respect. You see that name appear when the whole group of Sanhedrin Council want to oppose the apostles. He spoke up, even the most angry of them listened. And his words are powerful, his reasoning sharp. He says, if this be a man, it will come to nothing. And then he quotes some history. He quotes so and so did this, so and so did it, all came to nothing. That's in the book of Acts. Now he said, but this, this work is of God. If we oppose it, we may be opposing God. And all of them took the neutral situation. Neither, neither defend nor oppose. Because of Gamaliel. Paul sat under his feet and probably is his best pupil. See, how do I know? Because Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, he excelled above his contemporaries. That means he was student number one. He was a plus A student under Gamaliel. Now, look at his ability in Acts 9 without the Spirit yet, or without the anointing to be an apostle. It says after he received food in verse 19 in Acts 9, he spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Then in verse 20, immediately he preached Christ in the synagogue. Oh, bring men. That he is a son of God. And everyone was amazed. Tell you, he was a good speaker in a natural but he was not anointed yet. Do not depend on your, on your ability. If God had wanted the gospel to be preached in the most beautiful poetry that rivals and surpass all of Shakespeare's writing, he would have chosen all the golden dumb people on the earth. But sometimes God chose plumbers like Smith Wiggles who when he preached broke sometimes almost every grammatical rule in English. <laughs> but he broke the hearts of men. Brought more people saved than others. Remember in the book of Acts, sometimes they want to oppose Paul, they choose great oratory to come against God. I quickly slip over to the time when they were trying to argue how to extend Paul's uh, uh, sentence and to try to sentence him to, to death. It tells us here in the book of Acts uh, in uh, chapter 24 and uh, 25 here. 
that uh, finally when they gather to find a complaint against Paul and when they stood there before him they gather uh, and it was, if, if, it's fascinating the type of uh, challenges that uh, they gather against him okay this is in Acts uh, looking at chapter uh, the, in the plot, plot against uh, Paul that they had in, uh, let's look first at uh, chapter 20, over here in uh, chapter 24. Yes, I'm picking a good place to start. And uh, in verse 1, After five days and the nights, the high priest came down with the elders. And a certain or uh, orator, a speaker, who specialized in giving speeches, they chose the best of the best because they want to win the case. He was like the best lawyer. You know some lawyers very good at speaking. Argument. And name Tertullus. You can research on Tertullus. One of the chief orators. And you know how the Greeks love to debate. He will be like the champion debater. These give evidence of the governor against Paul. So I'm saying, why didn't God choose Tertullus? Because God was not looking for human ability. God was looking for human hearts. And I can tell you, one human heart touched by the love of God will speak the most beautiful words and poetry that the greatest orator cannot produce. And Paul, there he was, in Acts 9, wanting to preach. And he increased in strength in verse 22 of Acts 9. But nothing came up. People tried to kill him. You know, they had to send him in the end. And apparently, according to Galatians chapter uh, 1, that Paul actually between verse, um, uh, 20, verse 25 to 26, Paul went to Arabia and uh, all those areas for a period of time, of three years, before he went back in verse 26. And it still was not time. So, when he was converted, no anointing yet. When he went to Arabia, Damascus, with more revelation, still not time yet. By that time, three years have passed. Verse 26, he came, went to the bridge, still cannot, not time yet. And, in the end, verse 30, they sent him back to his hometown. Tarsus was his hometown. And you never heard of him again, until accident. Because when God begins something, you cannot do it unless the anointing comes. He had revelation. He knew his call. He had walked with God in Arabia for and Damascus for three years. Probably. He was still not ready yet. Don't ever anyone or you tell God. I'm ready! I'm ready! How dare you? Yes! How dare you? You're measuring your readiness by Bible school standards, by human standards, by your own standards. When God's readiness is not something you can sit down on an exam table and tick the box of answer subjective question. God knows when you're ready. If God says you're not ready, if God says you are, then you are. Sometimes when God says you're, you're not ready, all the humans around you say, You are ready! Look how old you are! <laughs> <laughs> then sometimes when God says you're ready, all the humans say, You're not ready! Look how young you are! So one side too young, one side too old, which one you want? 
You say middle age. Well, the problem with middle age is the middle age is measured by different people, different plates. To the teenager, 21 is old. To the elderly, middle age might be 60. It is not all these things. Your age doesn't count. Can I say a praise God for that? <laughs> how, how young or how old doesn't count? How educated or how uneducated also that doesn't count? Hallelujah. I believe in education. I have a PhD, another PhD in a way, and I do a few more PhD along the way. I believe in education, but it's not on education that we depend on. We're going to set up Bible schools to train people. We need PhD to set up Bible schools to have a secular recognition. But you can have a hundred PhD and God still cannot use you. Because it is the anointing. You can have human ability also. God doesn't do it. You can be beautiful looking or ugly as a dog. God still will use you. Yes. Because God doesn't look at physical people. Can I hear a praise call? Yes. You don't have to shout so loud, though. No? <laughs> so, is this important? Just teasing you. To understand, is the anointing that comes. It is not whether you are slim bill, handsome form, or chubby and round. Praise God. <laughs> Because the most important thing is the anointing. And when anyone sits down to hear you, all they want is to hear the voice of God coming to you. We are not so much bothered by fashion, because everyone has a personal fashion. We are not bothered so much. I mean, the main thing is, if whoever speaks, outwardly they might look like a toad, but when they speak, the choirs of heaven sing a lot. It is still the most beautiful thought I ever seen. <laughs> Sometimes you can have outward form, the most beautiful outward form. And whatever speaks out comes from the dungeons of hell. You don't want to hear that again. Which is why the most important thing is the anointing of God. So when God begins something, no matter what you know, no matter how much you know, or the what or the how, you still must wait for the anointing. And it took time. The uh, preparation of the anointing started in Acts chapter 11. It was 25 when Barnabas went to take Saul brought him into the church and that is where I throw in point number six because some of you are wondering wow, we're still on, on, on point four <laughs> we're mixing all the points together we cover all seven points it is important to be in the right fellowship because association point number four is anointing and initiation point number five is anointing by aspiration and desire and needs. Point number uh, six is anointing by association. When you're in the right group. Ephesians chapter 4 tells you. Ephesians chapter 4. Says unto us in verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every past does its share. 
causes growth of the body. In the edifying of the seminar, you need the right group. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Pitfield, and a few other in the Holy Club were in the right group. And they nurture each other to become the super evangelists they were in the first great awakening. If you never get into the right church or the right fellowship, you might live and die without entering the ministry. Because you need that catalyst. You go and check in chemistry, catalyst. Catalyst is so important that without it, a lot of things cannot be built. I speak to some welders. I always am interested in knowledge and things. So, a person who does welding, you know, they use fire. But even sometimes two metals cannot join. Not strong enough. They must put a third element that, that likes both metal and the joint is strong enough to sometimes become a, a something, a weight-bearing column. The right catalyst is important. And being associated in the right group will cause your gift to perform. If you have never found the right group, God help you. Start praying desperately. If you're one of those who is a lone ranger, say, how do we know? There are dark spots around your eyes even though you didn't wear a mask. You look like you're wearing a mask. And something is following that look like tonto. But when we look carefully, it's not tonto. It was your shirt all undone properly. So your lone, your, your, your lone ranger, more lonely than lone ranger because at least lone ranger got tonto. For you, you only got tuta. Say what's tuta? Don't know. <laughs> Something else that is not human. And you cannot make it. You will not. I thank God for the people who come into my life. I thank God for what they impart at each place necessary. I thank God for those men or women of God whose books I had the privilege of reading. Thank God. It is important to be in the right atmosphere to grow. In Acts 16, when Paul was looking around and he traveled to the area of Derby and Lystra, he found a young man there who has grown to a leader, but he's still a young man. He was a mixture. He was born, his father was a Gentile, his mother was a Jew. He was uncircumcised because his father was a Gentile. When Paul met him, his name was Timothy. He circumcised him and took him and mentored him. Timothy became a powerful man and woman of God under Saul's mentoring. It is important to have the right association. Now all his life people are frightened of Paul. After he is converted, people still frighten of him. One man believed in him. His name was Barnabas. That man remembered Saul. And it was that man who took Saul in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, into a church that was just starting, the Antioch Church. The Antioch church was exactly what Paul needed. Everyone was young. I mean young in the faith. Everything was new. There were no set rules, no set laws, no polities, uh, no, and, and none of the church policies and polities and all those things. Everything is just freshly baked. And Paul was there for one year, so they did things that maybe they don't do in other places. And 
one day, after about a year in the church, in Acts 13, verse 1 to 3, somebody had the idea and said, let's spend time worshipping. But this time, let's fast and pray. And so in Acts 13, and the church was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius or Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetra. So how big was the prayer meeting? Not very big. Only a few of them. Probably less than 10 people. Out of a meeting of less than 10 people, God chose to bring an anointing. Can you imagine that? Kenneth Hagin himself will tell you, he has eight visions recorded, in I believe in visions, in the book. And one day in one of their church meetings, it happened to be snowy, a snowy day, snowstorm. So people cannot make it to church. So he was conducting some sort of evangelistic and teaching meeting in his family ministry in that particular church. Because of the snow, very few people show up. So he decided to turn the meeting into a prayer meeting. The moment his knees hit the floor, he was taken into the spirit. You never know when God works. Here in Acts 13, verse 1 to 3, in a meeting of less than 10 people, and it might have been a long meeting because they were prepared to fast, in the spirit I sense it lasts for many days. And since they are fasting, no need to break for lunch. Let's worship the Lord. Minion, your turn. Sing. Oh, hallelujah. Hey, come on. Sing. Let's worship the Lord. And he says, Simeon, your turn. Oh. Everybody worship minister. And pray. And then minister and pray. And minister and pray. And worship and worship. And the Holy Spirit show up. And say, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called for them. God was ready to impart the anointing. And they laid hands. And on that day, the anointing finally, after ten long years, the anointing came upon Saul. He has been to all places. From the road to Damascus, to Damascus, Ananias, to Arabia, to all their places, back to Damascus, to Tarsus, finally to Antioch. Ten years. He was born again in Acts 9, AD 35. This incident was about AD 45. Ten long years. And as they are worshipping, so I encourage you, gather together when you have time. Now once in a while, you can enjoy and have fellowship. One thing that we are learning is fellowship. <laughs> because I don't fellowship much. And, uh, you know, I don't know how to bowl. I'm uh, just roll the ball. Okay. <laughs> In the right direction, I presume. <laughs> and um, so, but a church is a church. You need fellowship. So we will fellowship. And but it is important to understand that when you have free time, call someone who might want to pray with you. So when you have free time, you know, and you don't know what to do, please don't end up in a bar somewhere, sitting down, lonely, drinking your heart out, crying your heart out on the shoulders of the barkeeper. <laughs> Find someone who has the time to pray with you. Make friends, the right type of friends, not friends who pull you to the wrong places. Friends will pray with you. Worship together. Wouldn't it be nice when, you know, some of you have time, you say, oh, let's sing together, worship together. I love last Sunday. Last Sunday we were with Casey and Sophia's house. After we ate, we fellowship, 
had a look at his secret book of dreams. <laughs> we sang. We sang. We just sang songs. Wouldn't it be nice? You gather together, sing songs, worship the Lord, uh, pray, talk about the Lord, share. That's what you could do. You never know when the Spirit might come upon you. And there they are, they, 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 they didn't expect the great missionary journey starting. Imagine, the greatest missionary trips in the whole Bible, born in a house of less than 10 people who decided to have a private time of ministering to the Lord. You never know. What great things will be born in your HTB apartment? Things that shake the entire planet without shaking your HDB apartment to pieces might be born in your tiny little apartment. And, and we don't care how big it is, whether it's a palace or whether it's a tiny little thing where the kitchen, the living room, the bedroom, except the toilet, it's all in the same place. Who cares? We only care for one thing and one thing only. The presence of God. In Christ. That's all we care about. We don't care about the color of your skin, your age, your status in life, your education level. We only care about one thing. Christ in Christ alone. Find me a group of people who love God and I would love to be there. Find me a group of people who love to worship God, talk about Jesus. I'd love to be there. And all they did is just worship God and worship God. And out of that was born the missionary journey. And they must have from there tell the whole church. And then everyone in the church should know what's happening but when you went for look at the powerful beginning of the mission of journey born out of a humble little less than 10 people worship prayer meeting so the initiation the association and the aspirations sometimes all come together but each point is important. Initiation, we should learn. And to summarize this, in the commission or the great plan that God has for us, be aware of the times that you live in. And be ready to receive whatever God has. In transition, be ready among the 7,000. They didn't bow their knees to Baal and they received nothing, but yet they still loved the Lord. They were not prophets, but yet they didn't bow their knees. Because all they want to do is to keep themselves pure for God. Be among the five wise virgins. Virgins for God. Number three, when God completes something, be there to celebrate the completion. Be in spirit, if you can't be in the flesh, be celebrating to receive what God has. Number four, when something begins, be there in spirit if you cannot be there in the natural. To be part of the right side of history. To enjoy all that can afford you and bless you. To be on the right side of history. The right side of history will grow stronger and stronger. The wrong side of history will grow weaker and weaker until it becomes nothing. Number five. Pursue God and hunger after God. And remember, there is no problem too big God cannot solve. There is no mountain too tall that you cannot climb over, through or around. Because God 
allow the situation to have a greater anointing. If he put Mount Everest before you, don't cry. Say, why? Why? Why not give me Kinabalu now? Why must Everest? Don't complain. It's because he wants you to the anointing of Mount Everest. Not Kinabalu. <laughs> Whatever problems are before you is an opportunity to receive his ability. Don't complain if your life is harder than others. Say, why my life so tough? The other life so what? Hey, I had a tough life. Young Christian seminary was the most persecuted. Say, I could ask, why me? The other charismatic, why come on, uh, come for me? Only God knows. Because strong people come out of tough situations. Weak people come out of easy situations. Not always true, but generally. Because tough people come through tough fights. They fought the battle of life. I might be gentle on the outside, but if those who really know me, who have experienced me before, will know that on the inside is made from diamond and steel. You try to cross me in some area where it's God's will, the diamond will cut you. But I'm always gentle. You still can be gentle. Some people are tough on the outside, but inside like butter. <laughs> the moment a situation comes, they're the first to run. When easy situation, oh, they half and puff. The right word for them is peacocks or turkeys. Go for nothing except to be a Christmas turkey. They go <laughs> show off. Show off when it's easy. Then when the real tough times come, they're not around to be fun. It is important for us to understand that we need to have a strong desire for God. You see, if we don't have plant a church in Singapore, let's say, if right now, if, if I had planted a church, let's say, in the United States, you know what will happen? Right now, we will have all night prayer also there. I don't care how many people. We planted a church in, in Canberra that we pass on to someone. Do you know we have all night prayer in the winter? And most people, you know what? They start coming. Wow, all night prayer. Yay! But there are those who can start but cannot finish. Sometimes at the end of all night prayer, only electric people. We still pray. And then we also have morning prayer. Wow, when it first started, oh, 10 people show up. After six months, then me and my dog named Lou. <laughs> <laughs> my dog was named Mozart. <laughs> That's my wife. My dog was more faithful than the church members. <laughs> but we never give up. We will pray through until it catches on. Why? Because we don't depend on the prayer meeting. We will start the prayer meeting if we have to. In whatever country. And press on. Because as long as one person is praying, it's still a prayer meeting. So we must have that hunger. And I pray that being associated and being one together, that this hunger will rub on you. So that wherever you are, it drives you. So that when I'm not around in all night prayer, you didn't come all night just because of teaching. You didn't come all night just to worship. You came because you want to seek God. You're hungry for God. And God is around. Even if it is around. <laughs> Just teasing you. God is around. Even if I'm not around. God is still doing His work. Because the hunger drives you. Hunger drives you. 
So please, at point number five, something that drives you, the pursuit of God. And something that, no matter what, how tough the situation, whatever problem, you will find an answer in prayer and God bring it. <coughs> it's an opportunity for the Lord. Point number one. Number six, association. Be part of the fellowship. And as the church grows big to 10,000, 100,000, a million, billion, three million people all over the world, you still need your fives and tens. We still need captains of tens. We might have by that time captains of one million. We still need captains of fifty, captains of hundred, captains of thousands, captains of ten thousand. But we always need captains of five and ten. Because everything big starts from two or three. And it always comes down to that. Find your two or three or four or five and fellowship with you. Look at the Bible. You know Paul, you know Silas, you know Barnabas, you know Timothy, Aristarchus, and uh, Luke. See, those always hanging around each other. Jesus has his apostles. It's always this. It always comes down to that. And we all need that. Rub off all the black thing that cover your eye and make you the more richer. And start being just a ranger in God. No more lone ranger. And join the Texas Ranger. <laughs> no, no Texas Ranger. Just, just join the Rangers for God. And uh, not the Ninja Turtle, Power Rangers, what, what, what is it? But join a good church, a good fellowship. People who sing with you. Say, how do I know they are the right people? Easy. Whenever you're with them, it encourages you to love God more. Encourages you to pray more. Encourages you to worship. When you, when, you, when you leave their presence, it leaves you with great encouragement to love God more. With people you hang around with, every time you hang around them, each time you hang around, you feel flat. These are not the right people. The right people are those who refresh your spirit. See, Paul says something about, to, about Philemon. In Philemon, Philemon only has one chapter. So let's look at Philemon. And because that happens in other scriptures too. But looking at Philemon, Paul's letter to Philemon, he says here in verse 20, Yes, brother! Let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. See, there's this refreshing. You refresh one another. Then you know you're the right fellowship. Because it stir you to want to do greater things for God. Stir you to press on in God. Then there's the right group. And you continue to build that group up in your life. Everyone needs Christian friends. In this is a family. And no matter how big the church grows, we're going to make it a family. As a family, you need to have times of family life. By all means, be faithful and spend time with your individual flesh and blood family that you're responsible. But have spiritual families. People you meet with outside of church meeting times to fellowship. You can do things together. You can do your bowling or shopping or whatever, do things together. But also do spiritual things together to worship God because it will stir and build the anointing in your mind. And so the reason for uh, number six is it is in that kind of fellowship that one creates open doors. Open doors are not necessarily opened by big organizations. Throughout the Bible, open doors and be opened sometimes by one person. The butler opened the door for Joseph. One butler. Baker, poor fellow, he died. Executed. 
time. The story of Naaman came down to one little girl. One little Jewish girl. The story of... Um, uh, there, are, there are many little stories in the Bible. The story of Paul being saved uh, from uh, uh, some threat of death. One little nephew who was his sister's son. Sometimes it just comes to one person who is still in a relationship with you. Do not despise good Christian's relationship. Don't, the older you grow in Christian life, the more isolated you are. There is a commitment. To have a relationship, you must be prepared for compromises. I mean, you cannot always have your way. That is why, you know, uh, being in a marriage is different from being alone. Because you must compromise. You must give to one another's way. You cannot always, you know, press the toothpaste the same way. You know, cannot always do the things you want. You know, you must give and take. Cannot always be the king. I'm the king, you will be me. Then your wife say, I'm the queen. Then fight. Fight until there's neither king nor queen. <laughs> no, you have to give way. So every time you relate to people, you give way. And you give in here and there so that each person's uh, refreshing can come upon you. Most important is the spiritual fellowship. That is important. And number six is also for growth. There are some things That cannot be taught, must be caught. There are some things that cannot be caught, must be taught. There are some things that you can receive alone. But there are some things you can only receive when you are with Guru. So it takes all to help us to grow. One of the best things is, if you're always all alone, how do you know who you really are? Because you always think of yourself as the best of the best of the best. We are all vain. You're so vain. Unless somebody tells you all your faults. Say, hey, do you know? I don't like this about you. And these things are. Then you start realizing that you are not. You know, that there's a part of you that you're not seeing because we all have blind spots about ourselves. We don't realize it. But only somebody else can tell us. So you've got nobody else to tell you except your mother in grace <laughs> or, you know, uh, your father, but both have died. So now who's going to tell you? Nobody. You need somebody in your life. Now, it's okay to be a single in God. It's better to be single than to marry the wrong person. But, even if you are alone, single, the church is your family. We pray that you will find brothers and sisters in the Lord who can be your family. You can pray together, walk together, encourage one another. Because it's very seldom that when one is down, all are down. You see, one is down, the other is up. The other is up, the other is down. He is down, he is up. You can always encourage one another. Nobody goes through the valley at the same time. Climb a mountain at the same time. Because life is so colorful. That each one of us go to different things at different times. Different cycles at different times. And we need the church family part of growth in the impartation of the God. Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy upon our life. We ask, O oh God, that even as we come before you, that you establish us in you, Father, and cause us to know the fullness of your grace upon our life. So that we know, Father, these seven points of impartation. We know it is not by works, but by your Spirit. So we ask that your Spirit will right now come upon each one of us as we recognize the times and seasons we live in, that we can grow in you. In Jesus' name.